Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another one of our Wednesday night webinars with the World Affairs Council of Maine. Tonight, we really have the privilege to be speaking with Dr. Emma Belcher, who is the president of Plowshares Fund on a subject that I know has come up in our coffee and discussion groups and something that we've been thinking about, um, the nuclear threat and nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, Plowshares is a global security foundation dedicated to reducing the threat of nuclear weapons. Um, and before coming to Plowshares, Dr. Belcher spent nearly a decade at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, where she led the foundation's Nuclear Challenges grant making program. She developed and built the foundation's Nuclear Challenge Big Bet team and also served as an advisor in Australia's Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet on National Security and International Affairs. She's been on the TED platform twice, discussing the importance of confronting, humanizing, and ultimately solving the existential threat of nuclear weapons. And she is also a graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and was the editor-in-chief of the Fletcher Forum, which is uh, where we knew each other. Emma, it is so wonderful to see you again. Thank you for being here this evening. Terrific and to see you, Allison. Thank you very much. And we're also really super fortunate to have with us and I'm going to get my cursor over to the right screen. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Gibbons, our own Dr. Rebecca Gibbons of the World Affairs Council member, also on the faculty of political science at our partner, the University of Southern Maine, where she teaches political science and also co-directs the model United Nations program, the famous Mimunk conference coming up this May. Um, Dr. Gibbons is a specialist on nonproliferation and the author of the newly released Head Hegemon's Toolkit, U.S. Leadership and Politics of, nu of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Regime, published just recently by Cornell University Press, and several earlier articles on the subject, as well as one forthcoming in Nonproliferation Review. Again, Rebecca, thank you for moderating this conversation. Um, really great when I can have two really impressive and accomplished women joining us to talk on a subject of global importance. So thank you both. Um, also want to thank our World Affairs Council audience. Thank you for coming tonight, tuning in once again with your questions. And I want to thank tonight's sponsor, Bill Hall, past president of the World Affairs Council of Maine. As always, we could not do these programs without your support. You are members and our audience. Please, you can put your questions for our speaker anytime in the question and answer box. Just as a reminder, the chat is disabled in the webinar. Rebecca, I'm going to turn things over to you to get us going. Thank you. Great, thank you. And thank you to the World Affairs Council for having me today. I'm always excited uh, to be able to talk about nuclear issues and I'm delighted to be able to talk to Dr. Belcher about many topics. Before we get into the challenges uh, facing the world related to nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation, I thought we'd open by allowing you to talk a little bit about your work at the Plowshares Fund and explain what the Plowshares Fund does. Well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you too, Dr. Gibbons, uh, and to have this discussion. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so Plowshares Fund, as uh, Alison uh, mentioned in the introduction, is a grant-making organisation. So we raise money and then distribute it uh, to the best, most creative minds. We bring them together to try to solve pressing nuclear challenges. Um, through this work, we're providing insight, information, resources and strategies at a time where people are really looking for answers on how to deal with this existential threat. And we try to work together with others, other partners who share our values in a more safe, secure and prosperous world for all. So as you might imagine at this point in time and really since Putin's invasion of Ukraine and nuclear threats, um, we've been pretty busy responding to requests for information and trying to support the network of people um, who are doing this critically important work. Great, thank you so much. And you mentioned Ukraine, and of course we have to start there, right? With, with Russia's war in Ukraine and President Putin's nuclear threats. Um, these threats have caused nuclear weapons to really become salient, I think, in the minds of the, um, the public in a way that they haven't before. Of course, with the end of the Cold War, 
with the end of the Cold War, nuclear weapons never went away, but maybe we stopped thinking about them as much. And so I'm curious how you think the war um, will change the public conversation about nuclear weapons. Do you think it's possible that the public at large will become more involved in these discussions? Well, I do actually, and as you mentioned, it really has pierced public consciousness in a way that it hasn't for decades. And uh, as you also said, it, it seemed for many people as though nuclear weapons had gone away, but we never really dealt with the underlying problem uh, and the challenge of nuclear weapons. And as we're seeing now, they're sort of back with a vengeance. And I think it's terrific that organisations like the World Affairs Council are focusing on this um, because we really do need to be paying attention. It's a wake up call. Um, and what we do now and how we deal with it is going to be consequential for decades to come. And I, I do um, take some heart that people are paying attention, they're reaching out, they're concerned, they want to know um, how it potentially impacts them. Um, and I think, as I mentioned, we're at this critical point where there are debates about the value of nuclear weapons, um, whether they're a liability or an asset. And I do think that there are um, is some push um, and we're in a dangerous moment and we need to watch out for people who are pushing more nuclear weapons, more spending on nuclear weapons as the answer to the problem we're currently in. I think that's sort of more of a knee-jerk reaction um, to say to match this threat with, with the same threat. And I think it risks us getting into a really dangerous arms race. We've been in an arms race before. It was really expensive. We did a lot of work to bring ourselves back down out of that arms race and I'm concerned we're going in the wrong direction now. I do think that um, people are starting to realise the impact that nuclear weapons might have on their lives and everyday lives, which means that more people are paying attention. And when we think about what Putin's managed to sort of do just by threatening to use nuclear weapons, this has enabled him to invade a sovereign country, to perpetrate atrocious war crimes, to impact um, people living inside Ukraine bring about humanitarian crisis, food shortages, and we see how it's affected the global economy. And this, I think, is something that people are caring about. And we think, what would happen? What could be the implications if a nuclear weapon is actually used or, God forbid, there's an exchange or a nuclear war? People, I think, are starting to see how this could affect them very, very personally. So. It's hard because sometimes people get concerned about something and then the threat seems to recede, Times go, time goes on. People feel um, some of the threats that feel more proximate to them, like um, the economy, um, how they're going to make ends meet, uh, health care and education here, and people move on. But I think so long as we're able to make those connections about why nuclear weapons matter and why we need to solve ourselves out of this current crisis and the problem, that's what we've got to be focusing on. And I think people will, will stick with it. Now, as you're talking about people's knee-jerk reaction in terms of fear, that's something I've thought a lot about is obviously we see uh, new members of NATO. We see in in Europe, uh, people rush to get iodine pills, right? If there were um, some sort of explosion, we've seen the business of people who build underground bunkers. They think their business has exploded. I shouldn't say exploded. Their business has expanded, you know, in recent and uh, due to the the conflict in Ukraine. And so, I think a key question that we don't know the answer to yet is sort of what's the long term effect on the on public opinion. I think you're right. The the initial knee jerk reaction is fear. Uh, we need a deterrent, we need to be under a nuclear umbrella, we need to spend more on our military. But I do wonder in the long term how the public is going to see nuclear weapons and 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 think, you know, should someone like Vladimir Putin have them in the first place, right? Should you be allowed to kind of execute this war, um, like you said, war crimes in a sovereign nation and not necessarily have um, other states willing to help directly? Of course, we're helping through weapons, um, and aid, but not directly. So I think that a sort of public, the the long term effect on public opinion, I think, is is an open question. That's a really interesting one. Yeah, I think so too. And I think a lot of it will then depend on how um, this particular crisis and how the war ends. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, what are the terms of it ending on? And does it seem as though Putin's able to, to get away with nuclear blackmail? Is it seeming to benefit him? And how, if that's the case, do we deal with Putin going forward? Um, mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely right that down the track, it'll be interesting to see what the implications really are and how people are thinking about nuclear weapons, potentially in new ways. So to, to expand on that a little bit, I think the other big question is how state leaders respond to the war in Ukraine. And I think you're right that it really depends on how it ends, right? Does this look like a failure for Putin or does this look like, oh, he was able to do this, take this territory and incorporate it into, uh, into Russia? I mean, so far it obviously has not gone well for, for the Russians. Um, you know, it's really shown conventional military weakness. Um, but I wonder what you think other states are going to learn from this conflict. We do see some pundits and even U.S. officials like Secretary of Defense Austin saying that more countries are going to want to get nuclear weapons because of this war, right? They look at Ukraine and they think, you know, some people think they shouldn't have given them up in the 90s, even though I think that counterfactual is problematic. They didn't have actual control. Uh, but just to think that's a country that gave up fissile material and nuclear weapons on its soil at one point. And then Secretary Austin's recent comments about other countries are going to want nuclear weapons because they're going to want their own, I think he said, hunting license, right? So the idea that they want to be in Russia's shoes and be the aggressor. Um, and so I wonder, do you think this, this, this idea that we're going to see increased proliferation as a result of the war in Ukraine, do you think that's those predictions are right? Um, what, what do you think about them? What's your assessment of the risk after the war in Ukraine for, prolif for proliferation? Yeah, it's a great question because I think um, if we look at it in the longer term, I think it is possible we see countries, if Putin is seen to sort of succeed by his nuclear threats, um, it is possible some countries might see the utility and the value and decide that they do want to acquire nuclear weapons. Um, I don't see it happening in the immediate term. I think it might be sending signals that nuclear weapons are valuable, um, but I don't think we're going to suddenly see new countries uh, break out and um, try to acquire nuclear weapons rapidly. So I do worry about the sort of signal it might be sending for the longer term. I don't think it's going to happen immediately. But we do know that countries that already possess nuclear weapons are watching very closely uh, to see how this works out for Putin. And while the example of or the issue of China and Taiwan is not analogous to Russia and Ukraine, we know the Chinese are watching very closely to see how the rest of the world responds to Putin. And probably not just on his sort of nuclear threats, but, but, but what he's doing in general. And um, potentially Kim Jong-un as well. Um, we know that he has conducted more missile tests recently, is likely preparing to test a nuclear weapon that he hasn't done for a number of years now. Potentially he is looking and saying, see, this is why nuclear weapons are important to me. Um, they're valuable tools and he might be less inclined to give them up uh, down the line, um, you know, depending on how this goes for Putin. Um, so we we do worry about that. Um, I do think, um, I'm glad you brought up the fact that Ukraine's probably not a particularly useful counterfactual because there were many reasons it just was sort of a fallacy Ukraine could have kept its weapons. And, you know, not least because it's possible Russia might have invaded Ukraine much earlier to try and take away its nuclear weapons if it, if it, if it kept it. So I think it's always important to keep that in mind but certainly the signal that this sends and the perception that Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons and has now been invaded is really damaging and concerning as we think about proliferation. So that's something I think for the analytic community um, to really be thinking about how do we deal with this problem about the, the message that's being sent in a way that's problematic for us. Yeah, and to take that further, I mean, I think we have a lot of unfortunate precedents in this field, right? So we have um, Saddam Hussein giving up a weapons program, a country being attacked and him eventually um, being overthrown. We have Qaddafi giving up his nuclear weapons in 2003 as well, and then as part of a, another mission being killed. And so, you know, as much as each case is different, I think it's it would be really hard to be in the Kim regime and not think, of course, I need these particularly when rogue so-called rogue states are being 
are being attacked. Um, yeah, we, we, we have a lot of bad precedents, I think. We do. <laughs> um, I want to move on to talking about the 1970 Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which we commonly refer to as the NPT. This is the treaty that is the cornerstone of the global nuclear non-proliferation regime. Um, for audience members who are less familiar with this treaty, this is the one that allows five states to have nuclear weapons. Those were the five that had tested when the treaty was being drafted. So the US, the Soviet Union at the time, and now Russia, China, the UK, and France are allowed legally under this treaty instrument to have nuclear weapons, though they are per Article 6 of the treaty is supposed to pursue eventual disarmament or good faith efforts towards disarmament. All the other states that join the treaty join as non-nuclear weapon states, um, and they are supposed to have access to peaceful nuclear technology um, for having that, for being in that status. They also have to sign safeguards agreements. They have to allow international inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency to come in and inspect their nuclear facilities. And I think it's important to note that all but five states in the international system at this point are part of that treaty. So we have Israel, a nuclear weapon state that never joined, India and Pakistan, two nuclear weapon states that never joined, North Korea, the only state to withdraw, North Korea withdrew in 2003, and then South Sudan, the newest state in the international system has not joined. So that's all background and uh, Dr. Belcher, I know you know all of that. Um, so the MPT has a meeting of its parties every five years because of COVID, the 2020 meeting, which should have been a big celebration for the 50th anniversary of the treaty was delayed until just this August of 2022. And for the second time in a row, so this happened in 20. Uh, 15 as well, the members were unable to achieve a consensus document. Some people view that as being a failure of the treaty. Um, but just beyond that, I wonder how you, in general, kind of assess the health of the MPT at the end of 2022. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's the cornerstone treaty, as you've mentioned. Um, I think, you know, it really has prevented a world in which we might have many more countries that possess nuclear weapons right now. Um, it's it's really challenging, though, that, you know, we're at this point where potentially there hasn't been as much progress um, in terms of disarmament by the um, countries that possess nuclear weapons. And this is certainly something that uh, a lot of other countries are very critical of. Um, and it creates problems in uh, sort of, I think, the discourse um, and uh, dealing with this problem. Um, of course, we also had, you know, uh, the the 2020 conference, as you point out, was 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 uh, delayed. And in that time, Russia invaded Ukraine and made nuclear threats um, in in the manner that was really um, sort of I, I would imagine deemed unacceptable <laughs> um, uh, by um, by by most countries. And so you have that kind of political tension and situation in there, which makes me not surprised that it didn't achieve a final consensus document. Um, but I think. Um, you know, the NPT is in danger, um, even though it is the, the, the cornerstone treaty, um, you know, because of these reasons about the sort of perceived lack of progress, lack of progress on disarmament, um, and, you know, the precedents that are being set now through Russia's behaviour um, and the, the signals. Um, and as you said, we had uh, North Korea uh, withdraw from the NPT, you know, potentially, could we be looking at Iran withdrawing from the NPT at a certain point down the track if um, the Iran nuclear deal doesn't come back online and there's uh, increasing uh, tension there? Um, so I think it's 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 in a bit of trouble, um, and um, I'm also kind of seeing that there's more discourse now. It used to be kind of taboo to talk about other countries potentially changing their minds and developing nuclear weapons, but some of these discussions seem to be popping up in places uh, where they weren't present before. Um, so I think we're kind of at a bit of a rocky moment. Um, we've kind of been shaken to our core, really, with uh, nuclear threats in this way. And so we'll have to sort of see um, moving forward what this really means for the NPT. Hopefully we don't see it fall apart. Um, I'd like to think it's a bit more robust than that and could stand up to the time we're in. Um, but I, I think um, um, time will tell. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I might leave it there. 
Yeah, there's nothing like being a scholar that says we're, you know, the MPT is in danger because since the MPT, you know, since 1970, you can go back and scholars have said this is gonna, this is not gonna work, or members of the CIA saying this is not gonna work. So I hesitate to be to put myself in that box of other people who have who have said the same. Um, and it does seem like it has been quite robust. So are we in a different period as we're in this emerging multipolarity? I worry that we are, but right, we'll, time will tell. And you did mention the Iran deal, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which the Biden administration, the Trump administration pulled the U.S. out of, as everything we know from the IAEA is that um, Iran was in compliance with the deal um, at that point. And the Biden administration has tried to negotiate, but as of right now, it seems like negotiations are dormant. The U.S. has other things it's focusing on. Obviously, the, um, the Islamic Republic is dealing with many challenges in Iran. And I know I, um, this is a little away from what I want to ask you, but I, I was curious kind of what you're hearing in D.C. about the Iran deal and the future. And is there any future? What what are you hearing? Well, um, what I'm hearing is sort of a mix, really. I think there are people who are not wanting to give up on the JCPOA, um, the Iran nuclear deal, um, because they really see that there's utility there. Um, and then there are others who were sort of saying, yes, it would be great, but maybe it doesn't look so promising that we'll get back into the deal anytime soon. So it can be important to try to figure out some interim measures or some steps that we can take with Iran to make sure that um, things don't uh, progress uh, really far before we're able to find the kind of diplomatic um, solution and the conditions that would be right for that. And, you know, as you rightly pointed out, um, you know, now is is not really um, the uh, politically conducive time um, for a return to the JCPOA. Um, you know, personally, I think it would have been better for the Biden administration to get right back in at the beginning of its uh, term when you had a government in place that was more favourable um, to um, negotiating and finding a deal. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. And then at different points, we've been close to getting a deal. Um, and I think um, more recently, Iran hasn't really seemed willing to actually um, make that final step for, for an agreement. Um, of course, all of this is very difficult when the two parties can't be in or won't be in the same room together. So they're negotiating through intermediaries and the Europeans have done a terrific job of that. But I think we're in a position now where as close as we might have been a few months ago, the political landscape's changed dramatically. We've seen the protests in Iran because of the killing of Masa Amini, because of the uh, morality police, and the crackdown on those protests um, that is just a heartbreaking and a groundswell of support for the protesters. And so sort of right now, it's just politically very difficult um, to, to reach any kind of agreement. And it's also not clear whether Iran and the Supreme Leader actually wants an agreement right now. But I do think it's critical as we think about ways forward that the path of diplomacy is kept open for when it's possible that we make sure that there's no military action um, because we know from previous examples um, with Iraq, for example, you know, bombing facilities might set back a program a little bit, um, but it will certainly make the leaders of that country more determined to get nuclear weapons, likely, um, and likely drive that program underground to a place where we don't have insight um, into what's going on. So, Military action needs to be avoided. Um, restraint needs to be uh, observed, and however we can get to that is um, is important. Um, and that we need to hold out the possibility of a negotiated deal that actually puts more inspections back on the ground in Iran. That gives us a good amount of notice if Iran made that political decision to go for a nuclear bomb. So um, challenging times. How this will play out will also have implications um, for the NPT and uh, proliferation in general. I, on a call I was on earlier today, some people were saying, well, maybe Iran feels like this is the time to do it because of the distraction because of the Ukraine, uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, I guess I would point out that just on that kind of counter proliferation, the idea of bombing their reactor in Iraq, 
uh, or Israel bombing the reactor in Syria, that those were reactors that did not had like fissile material had not yet been introduced into them and bombing facilities in Iran where they're going to go up to 60% enrichment if they haven't already uh, is a much more dangerous endeavor than what we're talking about in those. And so I, we should be careful that when people are talking about military action, that it is a very potentially very different consequences, right, for what could happen if there was that counter proliferation kind of debate going on, which I'm sure that we will have because it's we've had it so many times before. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to pivot and talk a little bit about the newest treaty. So we talked about the NPT from 1970. The newest nuclear-related treaty we have is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This only entered into force of Jan in January of last year, so um, in 2001, right around the time when the Biden administration uh, came into power. And this is a treaty that prohibits the possession of nuclear weapons for all its members, and it also bans all nuclear-related activity. So you can't station another country's weapons on your soil. You can't have them on a surface ship or a submarine in your ports. You can't help another country build nuclear weapons. You cannot threaten the use of nuclear weapons. So by my reading, deterrence is out, right? Because you can't yeah. threaten the potential use. And so this was a treaty that was negotiated by non-nuclear weapon states, who I would argue were quite frustrated, as you said, with the lack of progress on disarmament through the MPT process. And we see that the nuclear armed states have largely dismissed this treaty. And this is bipartisan dismissal. So it was dismissed in the Obama administration, dismissed in the Trump administration. Um, Bonnie Jenkins in the Trump administration, I'm sorry, in the Biden administration <laughs> has, excuse me, has said that, um, you know, we're still against the treaty, but we may not talk as negatively about it. So our rhetoric may change, but our position has not, is how I read that. And so, and the U.S. and the French and the government, uh, U.S., French and British governments have had press conferences and press releases saying they will never join the treaty and that they do not believe that this treaty will create international customary law. Right. So they're kind of being the objectors to say this isn't customary law. We're not abiding by that. And so I'm curious how you see this new treaty, which has not was not created by the great powers as the other treaties have been fitting in within the broader nuclear non-proliferation regime? And do you think it will bring about change? And the, the, the real question there is how? Yeah, this is a really interesting case study. Um, and uh, you making the comment then that the um, some of the nuclear weapons possessor countries have come out and said, we will never sign on to this treaty. We do not view it as customary international law. To me, tells me how potentially powerful this treaty has become that they feel they need to explicitly say that to prevent the development of customary international law. And so that's just really fascinating in itself. And I think it's significant in the amount of support it does have from non-nuclear states. And it's a message that's being sent to the global community that they really are fed up and they want to see this nuclear threat gone. And what's interesting is that we've seen a greater number of non-nuclear weapons countries signing on to the ban treaty or the TPNW since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So that's interesting too, and maybe tells us a little bit about how some countries at least are viewing nuclear weapons and their role in Ukraine, as we were kind of referring to before. And I think it's interesting because some people have said, well, it's in its conflicts with the NPT and and um uh, you've I believe have written about this too um and I I don't think it, it it really does and you know the TPNW really explicitly supports the NPT calling it the cornerstone of the nuclear disarmament non-proliferation regime and reinforces obligations that are in line with the NPT including on safeguards and so I think there's a lot of work that's being done now to try to figure out, all right, how do you sort of um, implement it or uh, what do the words on the paper mean when it comes to, um, uh, you know, any kind of verification or, or looking at, at, at compliance. Um, and so I think this has been a really interesting development um, in the nuclear sphere. And I think, I think it can bring about change. Um, it's also centering uh, human rights in terms of how we talk about nuclear weapons and policy decisions and the humanitarian impacts of uh, nuclear war and nuclear use, bringing impacted communities into the conversation in ways that they haven't been in. And 
you know, shifting the status quo in who's at the table when it comes to nuclear policy decisions. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's interesting how much some people um, really don't like it and, uh, and they're talking out against it. And, you know, I, I, I noticed Bonnie Jenkins' language as well, and I thought that was that's welcome. Um, you know, we're also seeing some other countries come and observe the NPT at the, the first meeting of states parties. Um, some um, NATO countries come and, and observe the um, proceedings. So, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, we'll see where it goes. And I think it's real value now is just shining a light on the issue and um, gathering support, gathering momentum, whether or not it becomes customary international law. It's playing a, a, a role and a function here um, that I think is very healthy um, and, 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 and welcome. Thank you. Yes, I think, and I should have mentioned the humanitarian impact. And there was a series of conferences in 2013 and 14 in which um, over 120 states each time, and I think at the end, almost 160 came and heard from experts talking about the impacts of nuclear weapons on the human body, but also on the environment and on communities. Um, and I like what you said about bringing survivors in. And I think a real benefit or a real important aspect of the humanitarian initiative was kind of showing the international community that there are people with expertise on nuclear weapons that are not professors and not people in the in the labs not people in you know the nuclear priesthood and people who never wanted to have any expertise on nuclear weapons but they do because of where they live whether it's because of uranium mining or because of testing and i always liked um i lived in the marshall islands for a year after college and i always like to bring that in within the bikini community um, you know, they 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 have a lot of expertise on what nuclear weapons can do to you and your community and your culture and your heritage in the long term. Um, and I also love your point about I do think the vehemence um, with which the nuclear weapon states have responded to this treaty does illustrate just how threatening it is to put out there this norm that you think nobody should have them. You don't think nuclear deterrence should exist anymore, right? And that is very um, potentially threatening to these nuclear weapon states, as well as people, on, as well as countries under a nuclear umbrella, right? Allies uh, who rely on extended nuclear deterrence. Um, I all right, so I'm gonna, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay, one, one, one more point on that is that the treaty has gone further than anyone ever expected. It was really dismissed by the nuclear weapon states. And I think they felt they didn't need to engage because it wasn't going anywhere. And, um, you know, it, it it became, you know, entered into force and an international law, as you said, at the start of the Biden administration. And a lot of people dismissed it and didn't think they would even get that far. So, you know, that is something that is really something to note that, you um, uh, just the sort of the power and the force behind it is significant. It is. It is. I've had people say, I hope you're not studying that because you think it's going to do anything, you know, <laughs> because they think that it's not. And I mean, it is interesting that people just, so, so I was working in the air, in the Pentagon for the Air Force at the time when this first started to come up and it was like, well, we've had the landmine treaty and we didn't really think that was going to go anywhere. And it yep. did. And we had the cluster munitions treaty and we didn't think it was going to go anywhere. And so it was like, okay, we're not going to be kind of caught, not responding and I think we had the whole interagency kind of debate over engaging or not engaging and ultimately uh chose to not engage for a while um and and I think that was maybe a, a mistake on the U.S.'s part um yeah I did attend the first meeting of state parties in Vienna this summer and so I did hear every time every put up <laughs> <laughs> no it was it was fascinating every country in the treaty began their statement by saying that this treaty is compatible and consistent with the MPT. So that was the message that they wanted everyone to hear. Um, and then it was interesting to hear the various NATO countries saying, we are observing, but we have no intention of joining, but we're observing. So, but at least they were in the room and I think that there is value there. Um, all right, so I see that we already have so many great questions. So I'll, maybe I'll just ask one or two more. Um, but I, I was curious, as I've tried to sort of study the landscape of anti-nuclear advocacy in the U.S., you have people like Arms Control Association who are trying to influence senators and congresspeople, and that's where they think, you know, that's where the most important action is, and that's what they need to do. And then we also have grassroots movements 
where we have people going into um, city halls, town halls, municipal governments, and states trying to pass these resolutions against nuclear weapons, maybe in favor of the ban treaty, but several different kind of anti-nuclear policies that they want the US to take. Um, some I think is, is a great thing that we are seeing the beginning of an intersectional approach. So we do see people who are focused on climate justice or racial justice and recognizing there are overlaps between all of these issues and that, and that we do need to be working together potentially. And so I wonder what you think about the anti-nuclear movement in the US and is it too splintered? Where is it effective? Kind of how do you see the landscape? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because I've been paying a lot of attention to that um, recently. You know, it's a really small field of people, as you well know, who are focused on this. And just as members of the public have paid less attention um, since the end of the Cold War to nuclear weapons, that's been the same case in the sort of the funding environment and the, the money available for people doing this critical work. And you know, there really is an ecosystem, of, as you've described, and I like to think about it as, you know, we've got um, people at academia who are doing the in-depth research um, uh, and are able to maybe distill from their research what are some policy prescriptions um, that would be useful to reduce nuclear threat and, um, you know, potentially eliminate nuclear weapons. Um, and then, you know, a number of those prescriptions get taken up by people who are doing advocacy work, uh, who can both advocate um, on Capitol Hill to the administration about the best kind of policies, but who can also um, connect with the grassroots uh, groups who are um, trying to educate members of the public and getting members of the public to be constituents to go and um, you know, speak to or lobby their members of Congress to uh, get them to take specific action when it comes to nuclear weapons. And then you've also got um, you know, others who are coming at this from uh, different perspectives, the intersectional perspectives that you mentioned, looking at climate change, uh, racial justice, health, the economy, and people who might not have traditionally worked inside the nuclear uh, community who are um, uh, lending their talents in a way to this work. And uh, just as there's more focus now um, in the on the humanitarian side when it comes to the sort of political platforms or global platforms, um, there's more involvement of people who are directly impacted, um, such as Marshallese and uh, people from other um, parts of the world. Um, being involved in these kinds of conversations um, now. Um, I do think that we're in a challenging point because while there's more public awareness about nuclear weapons right now, um, there's not a large kind of constituent base. I think sometimes for people, it's hard to know what action to take. Um, it seems very overwhelming to think about nuclear weapons and the challenge. It's quite abstract at times, although now I think with Putin's example, it's become a bit more real. Um, but it's something that people don't always feel that it's so connected to their daily lives. And so what kind of action can I take? What difference can I make? Surely there are smart people thinking about um, the best kind of policies. And I do think that we've largely focused on getting the right ideas and trying to communicate them and push them to decision makers, but without really investing in the sort of education in the public more generally, without investing in education of those policy makers, the decision makers on the nuclear threat. And that means that we haven't always been able to get the best ideas into policy and into those decision makers because there's no constituent base pushing for it. So that's why I think we're at a challenging moment now in this field because um, we've got a lot of good ideas and I think, I think we need more innovation and more new ideas, but how do we translate that into action? That's the missing piece. We might have an opportunity now with more attention and more concern amongst the public about the reality of the situation we're living in, you know, under the risk of uh, mutually assured destruction at, at any point, the dangers of miscalculation, misperception, potentially irrational leaders, 
and some kind of nuclear ex, um, use or exchange that could go very quickly out of control. So it might be that we are able to mobilise people a bit more um, to really push for more awareness, more education and smarter policies when it comes to nuclear weapons. But that's now incumbent a little bit on, um, on us, on, on what we do, how well we communicate and how well we make clear the connections between people's everyday lives um, and this much uh, broader threat that we're, we're living under. I should also add that the um, funding environment is really challenging. Um, we've had fewer funders, um, people kind of leaving the field um, precisely at the wrong time. Um, and when we look at the amount of money in the nuclear space, it's probably in the tens of millions per year of philanthropic dollars supporting the field of people working on nuclear risk. Compare that to tens of billions on climate change. Now, I'm not saying climate change shouldn't get every single penny of that, <laughs> but the discrepancy between the investment in uh, addressing an existential threat like nuclear and climate is really huge. So we're, we're at a challenging point, but but we're, we're doing our best. Yeah, the combination of the funding environment that we're in plus the increased threat and lack of public interest is, I, I do think, uh, maybe novel in terms of the nuclear age uh, and in terms of um, the challenge we face. I, When I teach classes on nuclear weapons, we talk about the movie The Day After that was um, shown in the US in 1983. And um, I think something like 100 million Americans watched that, right? We know President Reagan watched it and it influenced him. And there's just nothing like that today. I mean, with our media environment, you, you just couldn't do it. And I, I tell my students, like the Game of Thrones finale maybe had 13 million viewers, right? And we have a bigger population now. So it's just, it's just we have nothing like that where you can kind of galvanize the community around that kind of event. And of course that movie now, when you look at the special effects, they're awful. And I, so I'm always hoping that Showtime or HBO or Hulu or one of these Netflix will come out and sort of have a new updated version. And so people kind of understand the effects of nuclear weapons. I think the Chernobyl, um, mm. you know, that short series, I think did a, yeah. quite a good job of looking at kind of radiation and what can go wrong, <laughs> very wrong. Um, but we need kind of more of that and just the the public domain. We do. And I think art is a great way of actually getting people to feel something. Mm -hmm. um, so I do hope there are other projects um, to get people to feel things, but not in such an overwhelming way that they bury their heads in the sand even further. It's attention. Yes. And yeah. I think we have that same problem with climate change is it can just feel totally. yep. overwhelming and what can, what can one person do? Um, okay. So moving on to the U S and Russia who have the largest nuclear arsenals, uh, each, each, the U.S. and Russia have about 4,000 nuclear weapons each. Um, China is currently estimated to possess about 350. Um, but this recent um, Department of De Defense report that just came out says that Russia could have 1,500 by 2035. I saw today that the Chinese government has come out and said, like, this is purely speculation, and they reinforce their policy. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I not say China? Did I say Russia? Sorry. Let me say that again. The U.S. and Russia have 4,000 nuclear weapons. China has 350, but the U.S. speculates that China will have about 1,500 by 2035, and that there's a sort of desire for China to have closer to parity with U.S. and Russia. Um, China's denied that, but that's what the U.S. speculates based on intelligence collection and what we're seeing in terms of building silos and fissile material, et cetera. And so I wonder what you think the U.S. can be doing to do better on engagement, particularly with China. Um, I've been disappointed in sort of watching China thinking that they would be more involved in promoting nonproliferation and safeguards. They don't seem to be there. I think members of U.S. or U.S. officials in general have been challenged to try to engage with China on these issues. Do you think there's hope for greater transparency? Are we going to be in another Cold War? Kind of, those are hard questions, I know, but kind of tell us what you think about the future of uh, US-China relations in terms of nuclear weapons. Yeah, I mean, this is really challenging. And I think um, there's a lot of talk about this uh, right now and concern about where China is going and competition between the United States and China. 
I mean, quite frankly, there's no sign that China's willing to come to the table on arms control. Um, you know, I think it would be quite a while before it uh, before it is, um, potentially when they've got more nuclear weapons to be able to sort of negotiate away. So there are very kind of clear signs that they're just not interested, which, you know, is concerning just sort of given um, the benefits <laughs> that arms control uh, has, but also the benefits of dialogue. Um, and um, I think we do need to make sure that we're keeping the pathway open to dialogue about it. Um, and, uh, you know, the administration really should work towards a path where it is possible to have some kind of dialogue with China. I just don't see it at any point soon, unfortunately. Um, and I think, you know, what will be important is to make sure that we're taking a, a good sort of level-headed view of um China and the threat and, uh, you know, working <laughs> carefully to make sure that, you know, there are conditions down the down the track where um, discussions might be right. But unfortunately, I don't have an amazingly rosy outlook on that possibility just, just now. No. And then what, so probably the same answer, but in terms of Russia, I mean, I think it's notable that during the Cold War, even during tense periods, we did have negotiations with the Soviet Union. We were able to come to agreements um, I think they just canceled the most recent talks and there's not a, like they also canceled the meeting of the BCC, which is the organization with a new start, the current treaty that exists between the U.S. and Russia to limit uh, our deployed strategic nuclear weapons. Um, what what are you hearing or what, what do you think about U.S.-Russia relations when it comes to strategic arms control? Yeah, I mean, that was um, concerning and disappointing too um, in terms of the talks being cancelled um, because the new START treaty that we have in place is set to expire in a couple of years, which might be a long time away, but you really need to make sure you start negotiating on what could be a, a follow-on agreement after, after that. You need to do it pretty soon. But clearly the political situation has made that really challenging. And I think um, what is... Um, uh, a kind of a dilemma here is that we know that arms control has benefits. We've seen it work in the past, um, but it does mean having negotiations with an adversary and an adversary that could be quite unpalatable. So the thought of having those negotiations with Putin um, is really a non-starter for a lot of people, and I understand the sentiment. Um, but I think we have to be realistic about um, what's in our national security interests. And that in the long run is making sure that we have arms control with Russia and that we're not embarking on a new nuclear arms race. Now, it might be that however this crisis concludes, there's an opportunity because we've seen this during the Cold War, you know, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think both um, the US and the Soviet Union really realised how close we came to catastrophe and the real need to put some kind of limits in place. And what that started off was um, negotiations and discussions about um, how to do arms control and then, um, you know, out of that kind of crisis moment came progress. So, you know, I hope that um, we end up in a moment like this again and that there is enough support for engagement and dialogue or diplomacy around arms control and when the the, the moment is, is right, because I just see that if we, if we go in the opposite direction, we're going to end up down the same path of spending trillions and trillions of dollars in ways that might not actually do a whole lot for our security and would make us uh, less safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've talked to people about that we almost need a rebranding of arms control because I think there is less understanding that it serves both sides strategic interest or we wouldn't do it. And that I think particularly in Congress, you said, you said some people, but I think the people that maybe matter most are in the Senate here, right? Um, and thinking, you know, that, that arms control is not a gift that we're going to give the Russians right. or a gift right. that we're going to give the Chinese, but we are going to find some negotiation space where we both find something to be in our interests. Exactly. Um, exactly. Uh, so let's hope. Um, with that, you've given us so much to think about. Thank you for answering my questions. I'd love to turn it back over to Allison to get questions from the audience. 
Thank you both um, for this um, important but really sobering um, discussion of a topic that we, I mean, one of the reasons I was so keen to invite um, Dr. Belcher here is precisely because we haven't been paying enough attention to this existential threat that is still very much with us. So thank you. Um, I want to start, um, since we've got a lot of questions here, focus back on Iran. Um, and I, I want to put a spin on this first one here. Iran stated that their enrichment work was for peaceful use in electricity. Um, and this is something that, you know, I've heard a lot from people when they talk about the MPT, particularly in the developing world, like you have in the MPT, you have a right to peaceful nuclear power. Um, when we think about climate change, nuclear, uh, more and more people are coming out and being willing to say that nuclear has to be part of the equation if we're going to go off of fossil fuels. But with Iran in particular, it seems that the motive is for nuclear weapons. How do we make sure, whether it's Iran or other places, that nuclear power plant development continues for the benefit of the environment and not for proliferation? So Emma, what's your thoughts there on that one? Thank you. Sorry, I just had pulled up the Q&A <laughs> and it was covering <laughs> your face. So um, the, the issue of um, the use of uh, uh, nuclear technology for power versus uh, weapons programs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I think um, what we worry about is that countries are going to use the guise of nuclear uh, power, nu nu using nuclear technology for power purposes and are going to then actually divert any material they create to be used in nuclear weapons. And, you know, that's really precisely why um, under the NPT uh, we have the inspections of those facilities of countries that don't possess nuclear weapons but have nuclear technology. The International Atomic Energy Agency will go in and verify that that material is not being uh, used for weapons purposes. And so I think the, the concern... Now with Iran, um, and I was just reading the the wording in the in the question. Um, you know, I think Iran has made you know arguments about needing um, the uh, technology for peaceful purposes. Um, you know, I think what Iran's doing now that there doesn't seem to be any evidence um, that we know that Iran has taken a decision actually to create a nuclear weapon. What it seems to be doing now is um, enriching to higher levels, acquiring more material as a kind of a um, insurance policy um, that, you know, it could, if it made the political decision to create weapons, you know, reasonably quickly turn that material into a nuclear bomb. And in doing this, it seems to be sort of trying to build up some leverage that it can negotiate away uh, under any kind of agreement with um, the United States um, and, and the others. So, you know, what we worry about here is not just Iran doing this, but, you know, could other countries potentially, um, you know, develop their technology, acquire material up to the point to the threshold of suddenly being able to use that material for a weapon? Now, there are some countries that do have significant qualities, quantities of material that could be used for nuclear weapons purposes like Japan. Um, but Japan, you know, hasn't been violating um, the, the safeguards and hasn't had that kind of, um, you know, the, the, the agreements and the scrutiny um, on, on its program. What I think was quite um, innovative with the uh, Iran nuclear deal um, was that it actually um, put limits um, on Iran and its development of the technology and material in a way that no other um, country that has signed on to the NPT and has peaceful um, uh, technology for peaceful purposes, no other uh, country is actually subject to that level of inspection um, and uh, uh, verification. So in many ways, people saw this as the gold standard and wouldn't it be great if the Iran case provides an example for the type of inspections and the rigor that you need to put and the limits you need to put around um, use of this technology. Um, so I think it's important going forward, recognizing that you know, nuclear power is um, seen by many as a way to um, uh, address climate concerns. 
is that as nuclear power potentially expands, um, that there are rigorous safeguards um, put around them and that there is an ability to, um, you know, not only determine what's going on in those safeguards, it's sorry, in those facilities, but now with the example of Zaporizhia power plant in Ukraine, that those uh, facilities are not actually uh, theatres of war uh, with all the inherent risks that go around that. So I think we're seeing a really real complication here um, of uh, nuclear power and its governance. That it was quite clever of HBO to rebroadcast um, Chernobyl <laughs> right during this current zone. Um, actually, I'm going to exercise since we're on the subject of of that. I'm going to exercise my privilege. We had um, Bill Taylor, U.S. Ambassador William Taylor, uh, former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, here last Wednesday night, and he made a really curious, not curious, but a very bold statement um, in response to an audience question regarding what he thought the potential was for um, Putin to use a tactical nuclear weapon. And he was quite emphatic that he thought absolutely not. There would be no tactical use. Um, and he grounded that on the fact that Putin had made this very bold statement about Kherson and all of those places being Russian territory that would be defended as if it was Russian territory and then not actually making good on that. Um, I, I was kind of taken aback by that statement, um, not because I didn't think his analysis might be sound, but because is there a danger, you think, in those kinds of statements um, or that kind of thinking with regards to um, Putin in particular in the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Um, I mean, these are many of the same people who didn't believe that Putin was going to invade in the first place, right? Um, believing that these taboos are still there. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you provided part of my thoughts. <laughs> which is, you know, a lot of people didn't think that he would invade Ukraine. Um, and I think to that point, what's connected there is that Putin himself has made some strategic errors. And he went into um, Ukraine thinking that um, he could very quickly, you know, take Kiev and um, Kiev and that NATO and the US would kind of their alliance would fall apart and their strength would fall apart. That was wrong. He miscalculated that. And, and I was very concerned when he... Um, you know, annexed annexed the, the the territory, and also said that you know any attack on Russian territory could be met with uh, you know nuclear weapons. I that was the most scared I've been in a long time. I think, and um, precisely because I actually believe that he might just do it, or that something might happen accidentally. Um, now, the fact that he didn't maybe does speak to that point that, you know, he was never going to and he sort of backed down. But I don't, we can't get in Putin's mind. And I I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to be wrong. Um, and just knowing the kind of volatility of the situation, when there are tensions, when there's conflict, there's more likely to be the chance for miscalculation and um, something to go terribly wrong. So I would, I would, um, I, I agree with you, Alison. Yeah. Uh, also, the accident point, I worked briefly with Nabil Fahme when I was at the American University in Cairo. He was our dean, and he would always say, the problem with nuclear weapons, even if you believe in deterrence, is an accident or a mistake, right? And and I take those words. <laughs> uh, when we... Um, uh, where are we here? So let's go to Israel. Israel's been talking about military action against Iranian nuclear facilities for at least 15 years. Um, they know very well that such action is highly unlikely to be effective. Um, will they continue with their successful covert measures to obstruct the Iranian program? Um, do you think that's a more successful route? And I'd like to go one step further. You know, what are the dangers of Israel as an undeclared nuclear state sort of pursuing this cat and mouse game with the Iranian nuclear program? Mm. I mean, it's it's a really interesting question and it's a, <laughs> very hard to answer in terms of what I, what I think Israel will do. Um, we do know that they've taken all kinds of action in the past, um, as is sort of rightly uh, pointed out. Um, and... Um, 
you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they're going to continue uh, in terms of the kinds of activities that they've undertaken to try to undermine um, uh, Iran's program. You know, that is not, I don't think, a winning strategy in the, in the long run. You know, maybe you can make some setbacks, but then you potentially also increase the determination of the Iranians to, to keep going forward. I think we're at a dangerous point in terms of Israeli activities and if Israel takes certain action that really does escalate tensions um, and, um, you know, gets in gets the Iranians um, to react in a way that is really kind of counterproductive, um, things could escalate uh, really very quickly. And so I do worry about the kind of um, uh, interference there. And I think it's incumbent, I'm hoping the United States and Israel having pretty close conversations um, about what is what is what is helpful and what's not. Um, you know, ultimately, there are people within the um, Israeli security establishment, um, former former members as well, who do really see the benefit of um, diplomacy and a deal, um, and see the, the the mistakes that were made um, by um, the Trump administration administration withdrawing. So I think what we can hope for um, is for um, you know diplomacy to be allowed to progress without some kind of military action or strike that could actually um, result in a really dangerous situation. And, and just to follow up on that, what incentives, um, what diplomatic incentives or other incentives, if any, could convince Israel to declare themselves as a nuclear state or develop some clarity? Or I mean, or do you think that this is just going to sort of be this continual outlier? I, I yeah, I think it's probably continual outlier. I don't see it as as you know likely as possible. Um, but you know, I I think just because you don't see it doesn't mean you shouldn't you should stop working towards it and thinking about what are the kind of creative solutions if there are any or you know what kinds of incentives need to be provided in that sense um so that's a really tricky problem for <laughs> really smart people to be working on i just don't see any any um any chance of it anytime soon I think you're right. Um, but I also think you're right that it's important to continue to talk about these things. Um, sh so one more question here. Should we not put our emphasis on, on arms control in the near and medium term rather than the speculative and likely unsuccessful efforts to push the ban treaty? Um, you know, is is it and I think you've touched on this a little bit that, you know, these short term games have real value. Um do you think that that's the more important direction? Should we do both in tandem? Does pushing for the ban undermine some of these very important interim measures? I think we can do both in tandem. Um, and I think that we do need the interim measures, but I really worry if we go from interim measure to interim measure, we just make incremental progress. So at the same time, we need to be focusing on um, addressing the immediate challenges. We have to be preparing for what kind of a world do we want to see um, with respect to nuclear weapons in 10, 20, 30 years. And if we're not doing that work and looking at a more positive vision of the future now and trying to figure out how to work backwards from that, in 10, 20, 30 years, we're going to be, you know, maybe in a similar situation where we've had another crisis. We're thinking, how do we uh, get this crisis to stop? How do we reduce arms again? And how do we get to a more stable status quo? I, I just worry we're just going to keep repeating the cycles. And I think because we, we've seen this happen in the course of history. So at what point can we sort of do a circuit break and say, all right, enough's enough. Status quo, the way we've been operating, isn't getting us anywhere and it's not good enough because the stakes are too high. This is our future, our children's future that are at stake. So I think it's really important to invest in both at the same time and make sure we're not so focused on the short term that we uh, neglect the long term because we neglect it at a peril. Thank you, Emma. Um, Dr. Gibbons, I think you had one last question about um, Australia, which I don't want to let go since uh, we have Emma here and she's in a position to answer this, or at least <laughs> we think we're going to put her in that position, whether she likes it or not. 
So my, my last question was about the AUKUS uh, deal by which the U.S. and Great Britain are going to supply Australia with nuclear-powered submarines. And so I think it's really important that we clarify these are not nuclear-armed submarines, but these are powered by a nuclear reactor, the same way the U.S. Um, US subs are powered by, by reactors. Um, and this is, has been controversial, and some worry that it'll set a bad, bad precedent for the nuclear nonproliferation regime because... To date, no non-nuclear weapons state has these nuclear-powered subs. We know Brazil is interested in them. And so I guess I wanted to hear your thoughts about that and also if, as, as an Australian to talk maybe a little bit about the strategic um, challenges faced by Australia, which has China as a neighbor but is a U.S. ally and is concerned about the rise of China, um, but is, you know, et cetera. So anything you'd like to say on that, I'd love to hear. Absolutely, for sure. And I'm really glad you started out by saying that it's to sell Australian nuclear powered submarines that would be conventionally armed. These are not nuclear weapons that Australia is now going to get possession of in its submarines. And um, that is a big misperception. And I would have a very different answer about this being a bad precedent for the nuclear <laughs> nonproliferation regime if that were the case. Um, but I do think it's a bad precedent um, because this is supplying. Um, uh, technology and highly enriched uranium likely um, that no country that uh, doesn't have nuclear weapons has. And there are other countries that have expressed interest in it, like Brazil. And in fact, Iran has expressed interest in nuclear powered submarines. And potentially that is a sort of, um, you know, a, a insurance policy in, in, in a way. Um, so, you know, I think um, the challenge here is not only does Australia now get access to this technology, but it's going to be very difficult for the International Atomic Energy Agency to verify what's going on with that technology and material. How they're going to figure out how to safeguard that while submarines are out at sea is uncharted waters to kind of make a pun that I just thought of now, but, but it really is. Um, and, um, you know, I think there's a lot of work that will need to be done by Australia, the US, the UK, in consultation with the IAE about how can you provide assurances that this um, is actually um, under safeguards control and the IAEA can verify it. Um, so I think there wasn't a lot of work done on that uh, before the announcement was made. And there was a bit of a scramble, I think, to figure out, all right, uh, you know, how are we going to do this? And how do we make sure that the IAEA is consulted? Other countries in the NPT are consulted because it, it is kind of a, 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 a loophole there. Um, so, you know, I do think it's a bad precedent. We'll see how it operates. We'll see if it actually happens. Um, I mean, this is going to be hugely expensive and quite an endeavour, um, but I believe the uh, Secretary of Defence and Australia's um, Defence Minister have just come out today and said, yes, this is this is going to happen. So um, I think the devil's in the details. Um, but, you know, I think it does speak to, though, the, um, the strategic environment that Australia is operating in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, um, with, with China sort of um, exerting its influence uh, in the region, um, Australia being an ally of the United States, yet, you know, um, you know, having historically more recent history ties to China economically. Um, and I think, you know, this is just a challenging, you know, it's a new well, it's an evolving strategic environment, I think, for Australia. Um, and seeing that kind of tightening of the US-Australia uh, alliance with the UK as well um, in this is really, as I see it, about sort of, you know, sending signals, um, you know, um, um, as about the, the country's resolve and that it doesn't want to see the region being bullied by China. Um, so, you know, it's it's an interesting development that it's maybe not um, surprising in the kind of current environment that it's finding itself in. Um, but I do think that there's a lot to be sorted out with the sharing of technology and how they operationalize this partnership that really is intended to um, try to kind of constrain China and its ambitions. Thank you for that. Um, I think we've really... 
um, encompass the world here in terms of looking at the nuclear threat from every different possible angle. Um, I want to thank both of our panelists. Um, Rebecca, thank you for coming out this evening to ask the questions. And Emma, thank you for doing the Fletcher Mafia so proud with all <laughs> that you have accomplished on working um, to tackle this most existential threat and to create a world that is safe from the danger of nuclear weapons. Um, this is actually our final program in our fall 2022 Issues That Matter uh, series. I cannot think of a more important issue to end the um, series on. Um, but I am looking forward to seeing everyone here in the audience in the spring. Please stay tuned for our spring program, will be, which will be announced soon. And I want to wish everyone a wonderful evening, a peaceful and joyous holiday season, and Happy New Year. Thank you all, and good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.